uh, young moms and dads to do what the Bible says we ought to do and providing them the uh, support, uh, some of it financial necessary to be able to move forward as uh, young moms and dads. Let me go ahead and pray for us and then we're going to dive into 2 Timothy chapter 4, a passage that you should be familiar with because it's the same passage we were in last week. So last week I preached for roughly an hour and a half. I don't know if any of you noticed that. This week may be a little briefer as we cover slightly different ground. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to dive into your word this morning with these saints. Uh, these men and women and young men and women of faith who adore you and want to use their lives to glorify you. Father, I pray that in what we find here this morning that we would... Use it all as fuel for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know that I'm actually allowed to tell you this, but anyone who knows me pretty well knows how much I love zombies. Uh, it's uh, zombie movies, zombie TV shows, and I'm not particularly uh, like a scary movie dude. That's not my thing. Uh, but I have uh, enjoyed uh, books and all the rest. I just like zombies an awful lot. So you can imagine my fascination when I was in college I, I met a friend and his dad was a psychiatrist and uh, he played a game with some of his young clients called Zombie Squad so when they had uh, preteens and teenagers come in and they were suffering from any particular kind of trauma and he had a hard time getting them talking and getting them to engage him about what was going on in their lives and how they felt and how they were dealing with it he would play a little game called Zombie Squad and the parameters changed every time but it went something like this look there are uh, zombies they're real they're maybe an hour away from here and uh, you've got a safe place you are allowed to invite five people to join your zombies squad. Who would you choose and why? And he would change this up every few times. He would say, all right, if you can only choose five people, and this time they all have to be professional athletes. Or, or this time they all have to be dead presidents. Who would you choose and why? And they would change the parameters. And finally, he would say, if you can only choose five people, and they have to be people that you go to school with, or five people from your family, who would you choose and why? Well, this was a great way to get the kids to talk about who they trusted, who was um, safe for them, who they felt comfortable being around, who was important in their lives, who they were close to, who they had relationships with, what they found important, both for themselves and for their friends. It was a great way to engage them in the conversation. So, uh, I found this not as a great psychological tool, but just as a fun social tool. And so in college, uh, anytime we sat around the dinner table, a bunch of us there piled into the cafeteria, uh, we would start playing Zombie Squad. And we, it would get absolutely ridiculous. And we'd sit there and, you know, eat our subpar cafeteria uh, college pizza. And we would talk about Zombie Squad. Now, here's what I want to do this morning. I want to play a little game, not Zombie Squad, but we're going to, you know, just Jesus this thing up. And we're going to call it Gospel Squad. All right, so Think about your gospel squad. There is a great, untapped, huge field of harvest that needs to happen outside of this building. Who would you choose to be on your ministerial, Jesus-focused, God-glorifying gospel squad? Now, you've already got some advantages here, right? You have a church. You have a church family. You have me. You have elders, right? Your elders are sitting in this room. John Lucas and Jason Eamon and C.J. Harris are elders. You have deacons. Uh, and our deacons, let me tell you how extraordinarily thankful I am for our deacons because uh, they, all three of them are working this morning. They are back here throughout the building. So we're going to go ahead and grant you some of that help already. But who would be on your gospel squad? Who would you choose to help you engage the mission that you have been given, that has been handed down through the ages by Jesus Christ himself to change the historical trajectory of the world by the word of God? Who do you want on your team? That's what I'm asking you. So you don't have to say this out loud, but I want you to be thinking in your mind this morning, who would you who would you choose? If you could choose five people living on this planet that you actually know, who would you choose? Now, uh, I, I say you actually know because sometimes you'll find somebody and we'll play this game and they'll go, well, I'll tell you exactly who's on my team. It's John MacArthur and Chuck Swindoll and David Jeremiah. And now look, those are wonderful things. You listen to them in the morning. I'm really grateful for you, right? But they don't know you. You, you know that, right? 
J. Vernon McGee is dead. He's in heaven. He may know who you are, uh, but I don't think he can hear you right now. So I want you to think about people that you actually know. People in our church, people in Rocky Mountain, Dorches and Natural, people that you actually have contact with, people that you could partner with and maybe already are partnering with to do gospel work. Who would be your five if you just had to have that number? Who would you choose? And maybe here is a peripheral question, but not less important. Who would choose you? to be in their five? And why? Why would they choose you? Well, we know who Paul chose, and we find this here starting in verse 9. Paul writes to Timothy, after his final commendation there, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. He says in verse 9, do your best to come to me soon. This is Paul speaking here to Timothy. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful for me in ministry. Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. And when you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, also the books, and above all, the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he has strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them, Paul says mercifully. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through the message might be proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And then we get a final, final commendation here. We uh, are going to grant the preacher here in his last written sermon the ability to have one more final point. Uh, he has a couple maybe. Greet Prisca and Aquila in the house of Anesiphorus. Erastus remained at Corinth, and I left Trophimus, who was Zoe in Miletus. Now do your best to come before winter. Uh, Eubulus sends greetings to you, as do Prudence and Linus and Claudia and all the brothers. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Uh, I don't know who's next to have a, a baby in here, a little boy or a little girl, but you've got all sorts of great names here, like Prudence and Linus and Claudia, right? Just throwing that out there. Absolutely fascinating. We can learn from what the apostles taught. We can also learn from what the apostles did. And Paul did something really interesting here at the end of 2 Timothy. He's taught most of his doctrinal stuff. Most of the theological argument has already been contained and explained and reviewed. But what he did here was he demonstrated emphatically that no man is an island. Everybody is a piece of the continent. There is inherently in every person who is a member of the kingdom of God a need for co-workers. And similarly, they have a need for your contribution to kingdom work. Everyone needs gospel friends. You understand this? Not everybody is a villain, though we talked about villainy last week. Friends are great and friends are, and you must embrace this, absolutely necessary to do God's work. Who's your squad? Who's your five? Who are the people that you would march forward into gospel fighting with? Into battle, into war for the cause of Jesus Christ. Who do you trust? Who is important to you? Who has the skills that you value moving forward into that great, that great melee into which we have been called? Who's your people? Well, Paul mentions a number of people here, and you can go back and check my math, but uh, I counted 16 plus, 16 different people that Paul counts as gospel allies starting from verse 9 and forward. Uh, we don't know exactly how many there are. We know that there are people like uh, Timothy, Crescens, Titus, Luke, Mark, Tychicus, Carpus, Prisca, Aquila, Anesiphorus, Erastus, Trophimus, Eubulus, Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and then here uh, at the end of our letter, all the brothers. Right? However many that includes. Paul isn't uh, a lone wolf. Paul's not uh, trying to do the work that God has called him to do all by himself, all of his own volition. 
Paul has allies. Paul's at work with a great team of saints who are all working toward the same goal, the same agenda, the same affections, the same mission, all piling their resources together, encouraging one another and prompting one another and even, I think, correcting and reproving one another so we get closer and closer to Christ's likeness and closer and closer to the kingdom and his work. There are people that maybe you would expect, people like Luke, and there are people here that maybe you wouldn't expect. People like Mark. Now, uh, go back to Acts chapters 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Uh, we know that Barnabas heard about who Paul was, and Barnabas was doing some great gospel mission work in Asia Minor, which is what we know today as Turkey, where a lot of the early churches were. And so Barnabas goes and, and gets Paul and brings him to Asia Minor. And then they are sent out by the church in Jerusalem on a missionary journey. And so Paul and Barnabas go together on this missionary journey. And uh, they come back. They start uh, pooling their resources again. We're going to go on a second missionary journey. The second missionary journey starts out well. They take uh, Mark with them. Mark is young. Mark is untested. Mark is also a little bit fragile. And in Acts chapter 15, verse 25, we found that the work that they were doing was so perilous that they were risking their own lives to continue to do what God had called them to do. And Mark said, hey, <laughs> now this is a little too dangerous. Well, they get ready to go on another missionary journey, and Paul and Barnabas are talking about who they're going to take, and Barnabas says, you know, I know Mark is young, and I know that there are some issues related to how he flaked out earlier there, but let me just say, I have faith in Mark. I think that we should bring him along. He will continue to mature. Mark is a good guy. And Paul says, absolutely not. I don't want anything to do with him. Give me Silas instead. And so Barnabas takes Mark, and Paul takes Silas, and then they march out into the missionary work they were called to do. And you would be tempted maybe at that point to think that Paul was absolutely done with Mark and you wouldn't expect to see him in a letter like this one until you find here, do your best to come with me. Luke alone is with me. Verse 11, get Mark and bring him with you so I can scold him again for being flaky. No, for he is very useful to me for ministry. Uh, Mark has proved himself. Paul's given him a second shot. Whatever intermingling of the circumstances that has to happen, there are people here that you would expect and maybe some that you don't. But of all these people, these 16 plus who are explicitly mentioned here, including others throughout the letter, I think of uh, chapter 1, Anesiphorus, who is, his household is mentioned here, but specifically he's mentioned in chapter 1, verses 16 and following, May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Anesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he had arrived in Rome, he searched for me earnestly and found me, right? He leaned on them for various things. So let me give you three. Three ways that Paul interacted with the friends that he mentions here in 2 Timothy chapter 4. First, they helped to meet his physical needs. They helped to meet his physical needs. Now, uh, go ahead and, and take a, a look again at verse 11. Go ahead and put eyes on that. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him to you. Verse 12, uh, Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. And when you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, and also the books, and above all the parchments. Now, um, it's interesting, the circumstances that we find Paul in. Paul has been imprisoned before. Uh, but here in 2 Timothy chapter 4, we know that this is probably the last words that Paul ever writes, or at least the last that are circulated to the church. He's imprisoned in Rome, in what is called the Mamertine prison. Uh, built 700 years before Christ was born, this prison is not the kind of prison that we think of today. It's really more dungeon-like. In fact, if you take a survey of all of the historical antecedents who wrote about the Mamertine prison, and you look at all of the adjectives that they use to describe this particular prison, all of them share one word in common, and that word is darkness. It was subterranean. It was built beneath the sewer system in Rome. The Romans didn't use imprisonment as punishment. They only used imprisonment to hold prisoners who were about to be executed or who had not yet gone to trial. There was no running water in the Mamertine prison. There was no food provided by the state for the 
prisoners held there. In the middle of summer, it would be insufferably hot and the stench of waste would choke most persons. In the cold of winter, it was so damp, the prisoners became frail and many of them succumbed to the elements. The only way that you could survive is if you had friends who were willing to visit you, who would bring you jugs of clean water and bring you food. And like he says here, please come before winter, and when you do, bring my cloak with you. I left it in another city. Without friends, most of the people who were accused of various maladies within the Roman Empire died not of beheading or choking or crucifixion or anything else. They died of starvation, waiting in prisons just like this one, of which the Mamertine prison is the chief evil holding cell in the entirety of the Roman Empire. He says, come to me. I need people not only who are with me in spirit and not only with me in purpose, but are physically with me to bring me the things that I need here. And then you can see his priorities just jump off of the page. When you come, bring the cloak. I left with Carpus at Troas and also the books. Now, we don't know exactly what those books are, these bound writings. Uh, maybe these were... Uh, books of philosophy. We know that Paul is intimately familiar with Greco-Roman philosophy. Um, he's familiar with Greco-Roman history. He's familiar with their poetry. It could be any number one of those things. It could be writings that Paul himself is construing. Letters and larger theological treatises we don't know. Um, fascinating to guess here. A number of New Testament scholars think that Paul was collecting data that had been written down by others because he was working himself on writing his own account of the gospel life of Jesus. Well, I suppose all of that's possible. And then he says here, above all the parchments, above all the parchments, almost assuredly, 99.999% sure, that what Paul says here when he says, bring me, above all else, the parchments. What he's talking about are the parchments upon which the Old Testament canon were written. Bring me Genesis and Exodus. Bring me Psalms and Proverbs. Bring me Isaiah and Jeremiah. Bring me the host of the stories of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Of David and Saul and Solomon, of Moses. Of the great prophets. Some whose names come to the forefront of our minds and others, maybe not as well known to us, but intimate friends of Paul in prison with nothing else to do but to write and to read, to evangelize his jailers, proclaim the glory even from within the depths of Rome. Bring me the parchments. Now think about what that means for Paul. I joked last week that great quote, I can't remember if it's from Erastus, whoever it is. When I get a little money, uh, I buy books. And if there's any left over, I buy food and clothes. Now think about what Paul is asking of his friends here. He is in prison. There is no clean water freely available for him. There is no edible food freely available for him. There is no heat, no AC, nothing readily available for him provided by the Romans. And what does he say? You must absolutely bring to me. Well, there is this creature comfort, this cloak that I need, but, but, but then bring me the books and bring me the parchments. Bring me essentially this book. Paul is so laser focused on gospel work that he doesn't at first ask for all the creature comforts that we would have thought he would have needed in prison. He says, bring me the stuff that I need that I can use where I am to continue to do the gospel work to which I've been called to do. Bring me those resources. Bring me those elements. That's what I really need. So bring me that stuff. Now, I imagine that you're in a situation similar to Paul. You're absolutely dejected. And he's made it very clear to this point that he does not expect to get out of prison. That is unlikely. There's been a great fire in Rome. More than 75% of the city has been damaged. And Nero is looking for a scapegoat. And he finds in the middle 60s here... A great scapegoat. He's going to 
use the Christians, these ones who are seemingly opposed to the empire. They don't worship our gods. They don't celebrate at our feasts. They won't even, some of them, eat the food that is sacrificed to our idols. They're anti-Rome. We'll blame it on them, and so we'll imprison people like Peter and Paul, who history will tell us were both potentially killed during the Neuronic persecution there. And what does he want? What does he see as chiefly necessary? What would you see as necessary? If you were being persecuted, if your days had been numbered, if you knew that this was it, there were maybe only days or weeks or months left in your life, how would you invest your energy? What would your priorities be? It's not, bring me all the ones I've ever loved, not chiefly. It's not, bring me water and food and clothes and make me comfortable here in the, bring me the stuff, he says. Bring me the stuff I need to do my work for Jesus Christ. Would you have the courage to say the same? Would you have the wherewithal in the midst of your own personal calamity to say that chief among your needs, the things that you want your friends to bring to you are the book. Bring me the sacred writings. Bring me the parchments. Bring me the Old Testament canon. Bring me the pieces that have already been written about Jesus. Bring me the ancient words. Ancient words will guide me, not only in times of plenty, but also in times of scarcity. Bring me those words. When I'm afraid, bring me the ancient words. When I can't see what's going to happen next, bring me the ancient words. When I am drained and have expended all that I have within me, bring me the ancient words. When I've been plunged into utter darkness, bring me the ancient words. When I'm alone and all my needs are ripe and all my nerves are raw and I have been divested of all hope, and there are but moments left. Bring me the ancient words. He relies on his friends to do that. Secondly, he relies on his friends to meet some of his emotional needs. To meet some of his emotional needs. Look at the actual relationships that he's formed here. If you go back to chapter 1, go ahead and take a look at that really quickly. He starts out in verse 2, calling Timothy my beloved child. It's a thing that he repeats in chapter 2, verse 1. My beloved child. Take a look at verse 3 of chapter 1. I thank God whom I serve. Chapter 1, verse 3. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience as I remember what? You, as I remember you, uh, constantly in my prayers, night and day, as I remember your tears, I long to see you that I might be filled with joy. Uh, here in a few moments, we'll read a passage from Philippians chapter one, and it's the same thing. He has built actual relationships with the people around him. Uh, when I say, when I am in my most tragic times, please bring me the ancient words. I'm not looking for someone who barely knows me to randomly appear in my life in, in order to assuage some guilt within them to randomly quote me Bible verses that will make them feel better and make me feel peeved. <laughs> I'm looking for someone who actually cares about me, that I have invested time with, who has taken the time to ask questions and then shut up while I answered them and someone to whom I have done the exact same thing. A church will die and will sacrifice all hope of ever completing its mission if we are all mere acquaintances. Do you understand? And so when we do things, and of course it's become extraordinarily much more difficult during coronavirus, but when we do things like have small group meetings and we're invited into each other's homes and we share meals together and we do silly things like go to the pumpkin farm and ride a hay deal and all of that, those aren't frivolities unto themselves. These are opportunities for you to get to know the people around you because guess what? Maybe now is a really wonderful time, a jolly time, a carefree time, but bad times are coming. And in the midst of those bad times, you're going to need them. So when we get together and eat tacos and talk about whatever, that's a really wonderful stuff. 
But you have to understand the gospel implications of what's happening in moments just like that. They are free to waste. Those are moments that have to be seized upon. Because it's in moments like that that we do the work to build the relationships so that when the time comes and you ask me, who are my people that I can rely on to do the work that we've been called to do? I can tell you, I know this person and this person and this person and they know me. And here's what I value in them. They value the gospel. In their last moments, I know that they wouldn't want all the creature comforts of the world, but they would want the ancient words. I want somebody like that. And I know those people. Because I've invested in their life and they've invested in mine. So, Paul appeals to his friends to meet his physical needs and also some of his emotional needs. We see that play out time and time again in the letters that he writes, but he also uses them to meet his strategic gospel needs. Uh, take a look at uh, verse 10, right? For Demas, in love of this present world, has deserted me and gone on to Thessalonica. We don't want to demonize Demas, but there are questions there. Uh, Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. And you can start to see Paul, the field general, putting his pieces around. Now go ahead and skip down to verse 19. Uh, Greet Prisca and Aquila and the household of Manessiphorus. Erastus remained at Corinth, and I left Trophimus, who was ill at Miletus. Do your best to come before winter. Uh, Eubulus sends his greetings to you, as do Prudence and Linus and Claudia and all the brothers. I'm sending this person here, and I'm sending this person here. Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus, and when you've come, bring that cloak that I left with... Here, even to the very end, Paul is working, Paul is scheming, Paul is strategizing. He is thinking about his friends as resources to be used not by him and for him, but to be used by the Holy Spirit for the glory of God. He takes very seriously, and maybe this is one of the things that was written down on one of those pieces of parchment that was so precious to him. Calls like in Matthew 28, starting in verse 16 and running through verse 20, what we call the Great Commission. When you go, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them all that I commanded you, Jesus says. Uh, he takes seriously the commendation like that of Jesus in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, when the Holy Spirit will come upon you, you will receive power, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. So even here at the end, even here with no certain number of days left, Paul is still engineering and he's still working and he's still strategizing. And like a general sending one division here and a battalion here and a platoon here and these soldiers here, and he is setting up the field in order to fight the good fight, to continue the battle. And he is not going to stop until God calls him home. Not for a moment. Not until the very end. We get a little clue about this, and you don't have to turn there. I'll read it to you. In Philippians chapter 1, during a previous imprisonment of Paul, he says, Yes, I will rejoice in going on in verse 19, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. And it's my eager expectation and hope that I will not be all ashamed but that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. Uh, if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which shall I choose? <laughs> I can't really tell you. Uh, I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because again of my coming to you. Paul, would you rather be dead and with Jesus Christ or alive and doing the work? And he says, well, that's an easy question. I'd much rather be with Jesus. But as long as I am here, let's do the work. Christ will decide when I get to go home. That's not a decision left to me. But the small decisions that I'll use by the aid and encouragement of the Holy Spirit every day is this. I will use up to my last day, my last hour, my last minute, my last breath for Jesus' work and not my own agenda. And if you're with me, that's what we are going to be about, Paul says. 
And all of his friends understand this. Luke, Mark, Anesiphorus, Kreskins, Priscilla and Aquila, all of them. What do they all have in common? Uh, take this life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. From the moment in which you first regenerated my heart until the moment when that heart stops beating and you call me home. Now, there is something really insidious in the Christian life. There is a, an evil in Christendom. And I've been thinking about all week long, what do you call this particular evil? And so let me give it a weird word for you to mull over this week. It's Availability. Now, I've got uh, friends who, some of them are closer than others, but um, we've got this kind of relationship, right? Look, if you need me, I know we don't see each other all that often, but if you need me, you call me. And, and, and I'll be there just as soon as I can, right? A uh, tree comes down in the front, and you need my chainsaw and my truck to come haul it off, I, you just call me and I'll be there. I may not see you between now and then, but you just give me a call and I'll be there, right? Now, I want you to imagine Paul, and, and Paul is, is running this race. That's a metaphor he uses multiple times in 2 Timothy, and, and he understands it as a relay race, okay? And, and it's the, the, the four racers, and they're all running a, a hundred yards there around the track, and, and the first race takes off, and man, that's, maybe that's Barnabas, and he's just running with it, and he's flying around the track, and, and it gets around, and, and Barnabas, and, and he hands it off to, oh, I don't know, maybe Apollos, or, or somebody, another great figure there, and he, and he just slaps it in their hand, and he just puts it right, and he takes off with it, and here's Apollos, and he's running around the track, and then he can see Paul across the, the middle of the field, and there's Paul, and, and Paul's already waiting, and he's got his hand back. You know, he's, he's ready for the baton to be passed to him, and, and sure enough, he, he comes around there third in line, and, and, and the, the baton is slapped into his hand. He just grabs onto the thing, and he's already running, and he's making his way around the track, and then, and then he looks, and, and he says, all right, who, who's our anchor man? Who's the last one? Who's going to finish the race for us? My time is over. Who's next? And, and, he, and, he, and he realizes, he realizes that, that the next person isn't there. They're not on the track. They're not beside the track. And so Paul is, is passing, passing into thin air. And he gets on the phone and he says, Hey, hey Demas, Kreskins, wh whoever that next person is, where are you? Where were you? Well, look, you know how much I love you, brother. You, I'm glad you called me. I'll be there in a jiffy. Well, Paul says, damn your availability. The race is being run. Where are you? I don't want you to be there when I call. I want you to race beside me. It's happening now. The battle is now. The fight is now. The work is now. I shouldn't have to call you. I should be able to look to my left and my right in front of me and behind me and see the great company of people who have been invested with the work and an empowerment of the Holy Spirit doing what they have been called to do. That's who I want on my team. That's who I want to serve with. That's who I want to worship with. Not the people who are just available when I call them. Who are out here on the periphery and they have noble intentions but are never actually present in the fight. Who aren't actually running the race. Who aren't concerned 
with doing the faith work until they are appealed to as if they are doing a favor for those who are actually in the ring. I don't want to choose for those closest to me people who are cordially available. I want the people who are presently running beside me. Do you understand the difference? Which one are you? Paul, in the first century, could he account for your whereabouts? Would he have said, oh, I, I know, I sent them there. They're doing this. They're bringing the... They are very, very useful to me for ministry. Now, here's how Paul ends. Verse 16. Now, he, he understands there are limitations. And if you have never had anyone say this to you before in your life, for all the virtues of friends, for all of the wonderful things that they do, for the fact that if you are going to do this gospel ministry, let me assure you, you're going to need friends to do that. L let me explain this single truth to you, because this is life-changing. You can't expect your friends to do for you what only God can do for you. Your gospel friends cannot meet all of your physical needs, all of your emotional needs, all of your ministerial needs. They're going to fail. Even the very best of them are going to have good days and bad days too. We find that this is Paul's testimony starting in verse 16. At my first defense, nobody came to stand beside me, but all deserted me. And he's not angry. He, he says, may it not be charged against them. He understands here that, that there is only one person who is totally reliable. There is only one person who will always show up. There is only one person who can provide all of his needs, right? But the Lord stood by me. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. That's the second time in this letter he's talked about being rescued. He said it again in chapter 3, verse 11, when he's recounting all the disastrous things that happened at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra and the persecutions I endured. And he says, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. He continues here in verse 18, The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. You need those friends, but they can't do everything for you. Only the Lord can. Only the Lord is your rescuer. Only the Lord can encourage you and equip you and empower you in supernatural ways. Only the Lord can do that. And so it's no surprise in verse 22 when he says, what is it? In the final words of Paul, the last words of Paul, does he say, gather up your friends, circle the wagons, get ready for the... He prays a little prayer. You ready? The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. You need those friends. And maybe chief among all the virtues of the people that you would choose to stand beside on the front lines of the battlefield as we wage against the devil and wage against sin and wage against darkness and war against the great host of all maladies that stand in opposition to light and peace and the good news of Jesus Christ. You need those people who stand beside you who love the word and meet your needs and are there for you as real relationships are developed. But what you really need are people who understand at the end of the day that they are not all you need. 
that God and God alone can ultimately empower and ultimately equip and ultimately rescue. The greatest virtue of all your friends will be those people who understand, like Paul, that you really need Him. You really need the Spirit and the Son and the Father and push you toward our God. That's their greatest virtue. Men and women, are you pushing your spouses toward Jesus Christ? Are you pushing your tw children toward Jesus Christ? Are you pushing your friends toward Jesus Christ? If you have been sucked into a monotonous circle of trying to meet everyone's needs around you of your own power and own supply, give up. It's foolish. Abandon that plan and point them to Jesus Christ. We will stand together in the great host of those who serve Jesus, encouraging one another for dependence on Him. And those kinds of friends are invaluable. And they're the ones who will help you fight the good fight, finish the race, fulfill the work of faith that's given to every one of us. Who would you choose to stand beside you? Who would be on your gospel squad? Do you know who those people are? And maybe here also, if the people sitting around you were putting together their team, have you prepared yourself by the ministry of the Spirit and the availability of the Word to be ready for their team? May it be so for us. Father, I pray that we would depend entirely on you and that we would seek out friends vital for this gospel work who are also dependent on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in the midst of hurricanes, and in the midst of tornadoes, and in the midst of earthquakes, and in the midst of so many other maladies that we're fighting through right now, in the midst of trying to send a whole bunch of kids back to school in what will be assuredly the weirdest school year ever, or at least in our lifetimes, let's close our time this morning by praising our God. You ready? Praise.